From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, a Ben J. Shap LLC production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Today, we're going to discuss one of the most debated facets of digital marketing, channel attribution. Joining us is Scott Vaughn, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of Integrate, which provides enterprise B2B companies with a software automation layer that ensures that their customers get clean and intelligent data for their sales and marketing efforts. Outside of his role leading Integrate's marketing efforts, Scott is a regular contributor to various publications, including CMO Today and MarTech Today, and he was named a top MarTech influencer by Afino in 2017. Today, Scott's going to tell us about his view of the role of marketing attribution for multiple different types of organizations. Here's our interview with Scott Vaughn, the CMO of Integrate. Scott, welcome to the MarTech Podcast. Hey, glad to be here. I love to talk marketing, technology, and all things associated with it, including attribution. It's an honor to talk to one of the biggest influencers in the space. And how does it feel to be the reigning champ of MarTech influencers? Oh, boy. I'm not sure about that. Hey, we all (laughs) slug it out every day and try to give back to the community as well. And it's kind of funny when you're in a position where you're the CMO of a marketing technology company, you do double duty. You have to drink your own champagne. So you're living in the trenches, but I also get a front seat of the roller coaster with hundreds of enterprise organizations. So you also can learn. So you give and get in this type of role. Well, I'm sure that there is a reason you are on the list and we're excited to have you here. And I think that you're perfectly positioned to talk to us about today's topic, which is channel attribution. And you've seen how multiple different companies evaluate their marketing campaign as part of your role. And you're also working to do the marketing for your company for Integrate. So can we just start off by having you give us sort of an overview of your view of channel attribution and what are some of the guidelines that you think of? First of all, it's very clear that marketing needs to be accountable and to understand for every dollar that you're spending, what you're getting out of it. What's it turning into? What's it creating? What's working and what's not working? So that bar is not going to move. That should be what we seek and hope and build for, whether that's technology, data strategy, the people, the resources, all those things should be centered around making sure you understand what's working, what's not what's contributing to the goals and metrics that your team has set. So in general, I would say that accountability is critical and we're not going back. Marketing may have been the last department or group to be accountable on marketing. As we all know, anybody who's done that through the ages was either, especially in the tech market that I'm in today, very product-centric or sway very heavily to the brand side and a lot of logos and t-shirts and all of those kinds of things. But today, we see more and more that attribution is how can I measure, how can I understand, and how can I impact against the metrics that we're trying to serve? And in the B2B world, more and more that's around how am I driving pipeline and revenue. So I understand what you're saying, where attribution is the use of technology and the sort of consumption of data that leads you into understanding the contribution your marketing efforts have to drive a KPI. And really what you're talking about is it's all about accountability. If you're going to put a dollar into a campaign, is that going to result in a reasonable ROI on the back end? I think that there's a couple levels of detail when we're thinking about marketing attribution that a lot of companies struggle with. And there's the concept of multi-channel attribution, right? There's multiple touch points for a consumer before they're at a purchase decision. 
let's talk a little bit about multi-channel attribution. What have you seen? What are some of the ways and companies that are doing a good job with that? Just give us your thoughts on evaluating how multiple channels can affect ROI at the same time. I think it's essential because especially in the B2B world, there's multiple decision makers. There's a buying committee, an account that's active. We also know that because of accessibility to information, so many more of those researchers and decision makers that are playing a role in that committee have access that they can get different information at different time. And that ability not only tells you how to measure it, more importantly, it tells you what you're missing and what you should be doing in the process. I think that's one of the great values of multi-channel attribution. In finding that right combination and being able to get the agility to adjust that, or probably better said, giving that professional or the consumer the control of where to go next, I think is helping. And I think until we've started to really focus and fix that, attribution didn't matter because we kind of rigged the game. We set up our channels. So that's what we're measuring against versus multi-channel attribution. First, we need to make sure that the consumer, the professional can chart their own journey. And then we're able to measure that across those different touch points. And that's not an easy thing. Yeah, it's interesting. As you're talking about multi-channel attribution, to me, the overlap between multi-channel attribution and multi-stage attribution and the overlap there comes to mind. And as you're talking about, you know, there are different decision makers in different steps of the process. That's what I mean by multi-stage attribution, right? Like, is someone in the initial impression stage or in the education stage? Are they in the decision-making sales process as you get farther down the funnel? You know, you sort of head that direction as opposed to, is my digital advertising channel mix or my event strategy driving someone farther down the funnel? How do you think about the difference between the two of those, getting someone down the funnel in two different stages and which channels are likely to drive them there? There's a couple of things here. And again, I have more of a B2B lens on this, but I think we've moved to where we're more focused on account movement, not just the individual buyer on a buying committee, but is the account moving in the right direction? That's the first thing. And the second thing is that I think overly focusing on the channel itself and not giving those buyers options. We know it's not a linear process. We wish we could move and push somebody through the funnel. I don't think the funnel is dead. I just think the funnel is an internal construct for measuring. It's not an external, really the way that people buy. For example, they may get very energized by a case study you published early on because they want to see what another company is doing. But when it comes down to evaluating the criteria, for example, they may revisit your case study or case studies to understand the ROI metrics, but they weren't in that mindset and say that case studies are on your website. So it's hard, in my view, to measure so much just by channel and more focus on the stages. Do you have the content, the programs, the activities to help advise somebody as they move through the process, especially if your solution's a bit more advanced or complicated, it's a longer sales cycle, maybe it's a little more advanced, so there's education that's needed. Again, those are more in the markets I work in versus it's a very considered purchase. Yeah. Are you a basketball fan at all? I want to use a basketball metaphor here. Huge. Great. Who's your team? Lakers. Lakers. Okay. I'm sorry. (laughs) What you're describing to me is a little bit of playing a zone defense. And for those of you who are not sports or basketball fans, I'll try to simplify this as much as I can. There's two options, man-to-man defense and zone. And man-to-man, you get one player guarding another player on the other team, and everybody just tries to guard their individual man. And with the zone, you have all of your players responsible for a specific part of the court. And anybody that comes into that part of the court with the ball, that person is responsible for guarding. And the reason why I'm saying that what you're talking about sounds like a zone defense is you're really creating marketing assets. We're talking about channel attribution that can really defend against multiple different use cases. Somebody might use a case study as a top of funnel marketing activity, or they might reference it when they're at the bottom of the funnel and they're looking for credibility or they're doing their research and their homework to make their purchase decision. Am I thinking about this the right way? I think you're 100% thinking about the right way. I'm going to steal that analogy, actually. 
because I think that's more how things work if you're actually going to do something about it. If you become obsessed with measuring channels too much, just by the nature of marketing organizations, we're organized by channels often. I'm the digital expert, or I'm the events person, or I'm the social person, or I do advertising. So connecting that thinking, you can get a little bit too caught up or the person maybe that's trying to measure may be oversteering to justify what their function is or, or their influence in that. So that's why I think you have to have somebody that is the, let's, if we're going to keep with the analogy of zone defense, you need a defensive coordinator who's looking at the whole way the thing, the playbook is playing out and what actually is happening. You can't have just individual people as social working or as events working or whatever that might be. And I think that's one of the challenges. And that's the way why I like your zone defense analogy. Thanks. I honestly made it up on the fly. It's funny. I worked on a reorg with one of my consulting clients. And as we were thinking of how to restructure the team, everything was very channel centric initially. And we were debating whether we should take the members of the team and have one person be focused on top of the funnel, and they would be a general marketer that is working on all of the different channels. They can launch a social campaign, an email campaign, do an event. Like They were just going to be evaluated on top of the funnel, or they can be more horizontally focused where someone owns social, but they're responsible for using social tools for every step of the funnel, top, middle, bottom. The way that we're talking about attribution, it's kind of like the latter of the two examples that I use, where it's like you have people that are focused on a specific channel. I have a social media manager, but they are responsible for using social at any point of the funnel. So it might be user acquisition, it might be retargeting, it might be re-engagement for lapsed customers. I think that is right, because let's stay with the social media manager they're then looking not to justify their channel, but they're seeing where social has the greatest impact. Is it in the beginning stages? Is it at the end stage? And they can adjust that not only for social, but then look at that dashboard about overall where it's working and not working across and then get that mix right. And again, that's why I think you need to have somebody in an analytics or data position that's looking at the whole picture and that you've set your metrics, you've set the measurement, and you've set the review process and the ability to understand it in that way. And that's, again, easier said than done, but it becomes one where you create the culture of what the role of attribution is, what are the metrics that matter, and they get reinforced. And there's all kinds of unintended consequences that we can talk a little bit later in the podcast if you start to oversteer or you're going to have built-in biases especially on the channel level. I want to spin this back towards talking about attribution. We've talked a little bit about sort of general marketing practices and how you create a team to take specific channels and reach your customers, depending on what the needs are throughout the funnel. When you have this sort of vertically enabled team, right, where people are channel owners responsible for the entire funnel... How do you think about attribution? Like, how do you associate value with those channels when they do cover everything from acquisition to retention? Well, I think in a couple of ways. And when you think about that, how that all works. So first of all, it's okay to get that level of detail. You want people owning the responsibility. Say, again, if they're the social or their events person, you want them to be able to measure it. But the first thing you have to do is set, what's the big picture metrics? What are we attributing for? What are we trying to hit? And I'm emphasizing that because everybody has to understand the big metrics, the metrics that matter, not necessarily the vanity metrics, which can be clicks and impressions and things that can cloud because you're trying to get that volume up. The second part of that is you want to make sure that the compensation is there on the big picture and the rewards and benefits are there on the big picture to be able to do that. And those then try to set you up in a better way to be able then focus on where is it that I should be spending time with my social effort, keeping that analogy. Should I be spending it on more of driving that initial engagement? For example, in B2B with account-based strategies, social is more and more used to reach out and also help that account, the multiple decision makers, actually move through their journey and the process. Yeah. One of the things that I'm thinking about as you're talking is 
You mentioned that you're aligning how people are evaluated with the important KPIs and their compensation be tied into it and moving beyond the vanity metrics like clicks, like impressions, even visitors. Really what you're doing is getting past the marketing metrics and getting into the company's financials, right? It's understanding that a visitor has a certain conversion percentage. What you're really trying to do is work everything down to dollars in pockets. I think so. And focused on outcomes. And if your metric, for example, in marketing is how many meetings you get or how much pipeline that's connected to, or maybe it's actually revenue or lifetime value, all of those are valid metrics, but everything's going to be steered on those outcome metrics and working back. And I want to emphasize, we call them vanity metrics to the practitioner. They may be very, very important. But that's not attribution. That is ability to measure, is this working? Does X move or Y move or X tactic or Y tactic results in better outcomes? So practitioners, you have to click down a level right under attribution, which is, does this lead to the outcomes I want? And that's why attribution is so strong if you tie it to the outcomes and what else it's impacting. So here's a question I want to ask you that I think is unanswerable. Are you ready? Oh, boy. We've talked a lot about digital marketing channels, and I understand how attribution is a lot easier to assign when you have something like an impression and a click, and you can track somebody's journey all the way through because you're understanding when they're engaged with a specific channel. There's another component of marketing, and I'll state that I have a bias here because I am a podcaster, and right now, the way that podcasts work, it is damn near impossible to track real attribution or direct attribution to the podcast medium, and it's something that I struggle with and consulting clients of mine struggle with too, is when I take on this advertising activity or this content creation activity, I don't have the ability to drop a click when somebody has engaged with my content. And this is a problem that happens across all other channels that are not traditional digital marketing channels. It's hard to know when somebody listens to your radio ads. It's hard to know when somebody goes by your billboard. It's hard to see when somebody has a brand impression that is not a digital one. So how do you think about attribution for channels that are not directly trackable? So I'll level that up just a bit because we're going through this right now and give you more of the conversation I've been having with a lot of other CMOs and marketers. I think the reality is for most companies and depending where your brand and your business cycle is in the markets you compete in, because that that's going to vary, that's going to impact what you do. Uh, you have to dedicate a certain amount of budget to brand activities. And those could be thought leadership, some of the stuff you're talking about, especially with podcast and being able to get your voice and contribute. Some of it can be to direct helping people educate what your brand stands for and what your customer experience is. I just, as a philosophy, as a CMO, especially if you don't have a big brand that has high awareness or you're trying to either pivot or remake a brand as you move into maybe new markets or broader markets, you have to invest a certain amount of money in that. And that's not going to be measurable for a year or two. That doesn't mean you can't do surveys and that you can't track it and that you don't have some quantitative measures. You can, but getting obsessed with that attribution is a dead end road in that world. You just know you have to dedicate some percentage to that. Great, Scott. How much should you contribute? Well, it depends on the marketing cycle you're in. And I'll give you an example. We're at a place where we've done really well in the B2B marketing tech community. We've really established a strong brand, kind of the insiders, so to speak, the thought leaders, the game changers, organizations that are more advanced. We're moving to the next level of more of a mainstream market. That branding activity, we have to lay the groundwork. Experience tells you that if you don't invest in the thought leadership and the brand activities to that broader market, it's going to be a lot harder to generate that demand in that pipeline. So attribution comes in the form of there's some part of the recipe and formula that has to be driven. And I think that's more B2B centric than B2C, where that digital dollar display, as you said, or that podcast is a bit harder to attribute. We just know in B2B that there has to be those activities that are complementing it. And let me emphasize why you know that. Because you can literally see the advancement of pipeline 
the net new openings of conversations slow down when you back off that brand activity. And that is how you begin to measure, maybe not fully attribute, but measure that activity. And you have to be able to use that data to have a conversation with the powers that be, whether that be the executive team, the board, or your financial team. There's one spot that I want to disagree with you politely, and then there's one pearl of wisdom that I want to reiterate. Where I disagree with what you're saying is that the brand awareness is something that's more important in, I don't know if you said more important, but a heavier emphasis for B2B companies. I look at the biggest B2C companies in the world, the Coca-Cola, Apple, McDonald's of the world, and the level of brand impressions that they've built over a long period of time. There's signs for Coca-Cola all over the world in every country. You cannot escape them to the point you don't even recognize them anymore. If I said that, that's not what I meant. What I meant is in B2B markets, it depends on your maturity. There's new companies being started every day. Right. So that's what I was emphasizing. B2B marketers can learn a ton from B2C about building brand and building experience. A lot of us suck at it. So my emphasis was more on the emphasis around B2B and the need to build brand because we haven't done it. It's been very pipeline and demand oriented. We're totally in agreement. And I think what I said was the pearl of wisdom that I want to reiterate is the notion of the importance of brand activities and putting that into a more quantifiable sense, keeping your impression levels high over a long period of time. So when your customer is ready to engage with your more direct response driven marketing activities, you are the first person that they think of, that you are relevant and they have a recent memory of your brand and what it stands for. So you're just on the tip of their tongue when they're ready to get to the top of your funnel, when they're ready to take the next step and work their way down towards being a conversion or being a customer. And what I think is important for marketers to understand is the idea of patience. And there is a important mix of direct response and brand marketing activities that B2B and B2C brands need to take to build a sustainable brand over the long haul. It's the difference between eating your vegetables and eating sugar. You can do direct response and you will see those activities almost in real time. And that's one of the reasons why marketers have favored direct response and digital marketing most recently. And that stuff is great, mostly when you're just getting started to build a long-term sustainable brand. You need that war chest of longer-term investments, those brand activities, and those take a long time to measure. And that's one of the things that you've said that I think is incredibly wise and want to reiterate. Well, thanks. And we call them, and I've picked this language up over the last decade, is there's painkillers and vitamins. And believe me, you can go out and hit some numbers and really make things happen. But if you want to be a sustained player, you have to build a brand by working out, taking vitamins, eating right. And it's not about just the number impressions, although there's very much math involved. It's also the right impressions, especially today. We're so much more sensitive and rightly so, about brands we believe in and brands we do business with. Look at Nike and the Colin Kaepernick work that they did. They aligned with their cultural values and what they thought was right and ended up being a very good brand effort that they made when they made a stand. You're seeing that more and more. And that's because we all expect better customer experiences inside the product, with the people, with the website, with whatever we're interacting with are all parts of the brand today. And I think that's changed the rules and it's changed how we think about that. And some of that is attributable and in the immediate touch, others, it's in a bigger bucket that's, as you said, longer term. And I really agree with that. I love the metaphor of vitamins and painkillers. And I think that's a great place for us to land the page today. So that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks to Scott Vaughn, CMO of Integrate, for joining us. In part two of our interview, which we're going to publish tomorrow, Scott is going to tell us a little bit more about what attribution means specifically in the B2B space. If you can't wait until our next episode and you'd like to learn more about Scott, you can click on the link to his LinkedIn profile in his bio in our show notes, or you can tweet him at Scott A. Vaughn, that's S-C-O-T-T-A-V-A-U-G-H-N, or you can visit his company website, integrate.com, I-N-T-E-G-R-A-T-E. 
If you're a subscriber to the MarTech Podcast, thank you for being a member of our community. We always want to hear from you, so we created benjshap.com slash question, where you can send us your marketing questions, which we'll answer live on our show. Of course, you could also reach out on social media. My handle is benjshap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P, on LinkedIn and Twitter. If you haven't subscribed yet and you want a weekly stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, in addition to part two of our conversation with Scott Vaughn, the CMO of Integrate, We've got some great episodes lined up over the next few weeks. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app, and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. Okay, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy.